This is a picture test in practical anatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer and listen to the comments and explanations. Identify the bony prominence A and the fibrous sheath B. A is a bony prominence on the medial side of the dorsum of the forearm. It is the head of the ulna, and it becomes more prominent in pronation. Feel that on yourself. B is the extensor expansion, the triangular aponeurosis that wraps around the dorsum and sides of the heads of the metacarpal and proximal phalanges. You can see here the visor-like hood, which is attached on each side to the palmar ligament of the metacarpophalangeal joint. A 45-year-old lady slipped on a wet floor and fractured one of her upper limb bones. The fracture was treated accordingly. Six weeks later, after removal of the plaster cast, she presented with inability to extend her wrist and diminished sensation in the hand. Which nerve injury is responsible for the deformity and which bone was most likely fractured, describe the area of loss of sensation in the hand. This is a wrist drop deformity resulting from paralysis of the muscles of the extensor compartment of the forearm. These muscles are supplied by a branch from the radial nerve, the nerve of extensor compartments. The wrist cannot be extended and it drops by the action of gravity when these extensor muscles are paralyzed. According to the scenario, the radial nerve was most likely injured by a fracture of the shaft of the humerus. At this location, the radial nerve is in close proximity to the bone as it spirals around the bone in the spiral groove or radial groove of the humerus. Thus, the nerve injury may be due to the fracture itself, the fracture of the shaft, of the humerus or it may occur subsequently being compressed during the formation of the callus. Now regarding the area of loss of sensation in the hand there will be loss of sensation on the lateral side of the dorsum of the hand mainly at the root of the thumb. This area is supplied by the superficial branch of the radial nerve which supplies the lateral two-thirds of the dorsum of the hand and the lateral three and a half fingers proximal to their nail beds. Which group of muscles is wasted in this patient and what is the action of these muscles? Apparently from this photograph the wasted muscles are the dorsal interossei. As their name indicates they are located between the metacarpal bones, between bones. The dorsal interossei are bulky, particularly the first dorsal interosseus, which is located between the thumb and the index finger. Adduct your thumb and note the bulk of the first dorsal interosseus muscle. All the interossei are supplied by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. However, in terms of segmental innervation, they belong to the myotome of T1. In long-standing cases of denervation of these muscles, there is hollowness between the metacarpal bones as seen in this patient because of the wasting of the interossei. Now regarding the function, the dorsal interossei, they abduct, dab, while the palmar interossei, they adduct, pad. It should be remembered that the interossei are not only attached to the proximal phalanges, but also to the extensor expansion. So when the dorsal interossei contract together with the palmar group, the adduction will cancel out abduction and both groups will act on the extensor expansion, causing flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joints, a function that is similar to the lumbricals. A 30-year-old butcher lacerated his wrist. Two months after the injury, the patient is unable to oppose his thumb. His right hand looks flattened. Which nerve is damaged in this patient? At this location, proximal to the wrist, 
the median nerve may be injured as it lies between flexor carpi radialis and flexor digitorum superficialis, just deep and lateral to the tendon of palmaris longus. The ulnar nerve is less likely injured in this patient because it is more medially located. In addition, the history of the patient supports median nerve injury. Two months later, the thenar muscles are paralyzed and wasted, and these thenar muscles are supplied by the median nerve. And when, because they become wasted, the, the thenar eminence is flattened. Opposition and abduction of the thumb are not possible because of paralysis of the thenar muscles, especially opposition because the opponent's pollicis is supplied by the median nerve distal to the location of the injury. Identify the joints A, B, and C. What is the type and variety of each? All are synovial joints, allowing considerable degree of movement and having the features of a synovial joint. A is a proximal interphalangeal joint. It is a hinge variety, allowing flexion extension movements only. B is a metacarpophalangeal joint. It is a condyloid variety of synovial joint, allowing flexion extension on one axis and adduction abduction on a second axis. So it is a biaxial joint. Of course, a combination of these movements is called circumduction. And this is not a movement by itself, but a combination of the previously mentioned movement, flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction. It should be differentiated from rotation, which if present should be around a third axis that is parallel to the long axis of bones. And we don't have this axis or this movement at this joint. So there is circumduction, but not rotation. Otherwise, the joint will become a ball and socket joint. C is the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. It is located between the trapezium, a carpal bone, and the base of the first metacarpal bone. It is a typical example of a saddle variety of a synovial joint, which allows more freedom of movement for the thumb comparing this joint to corresponding joints of the other fingers the other carpometacarpal joints are of the plain variety of synovial joints not of the saddle variety in the saddle variety the articular surfaces are concavo convex they are not plain they look like a saddle and they allow more freedom of flexion extension abduction adduction as well as opposition of the thumb, which is required for the pincer-like action of the hand. In this V-sign hand gesture, which specific muscles keep the index and middle fingers apart? The muscles are the dorsal interossei, which abduct, dab, dorsal abduct. It should also be remembered that the axis of abduction and adduction passes through the middle finger. Thus, we can work out the dorsal interossei as follows. The thumb and little finger have their own abductors, abductor pollicis and abductor digiti minimi, so there is no dorsal interosseus attached to them. The third finger has two dorsal interossei attached to it, since any movement to the side is a movement of abduction away from the median plane of the hand. Thus, in the V sign, the index is abducted by the first dorsal interosseous muscle, while the middle finger is medially abducted by the third dorsal interosseous. The second dorsal interosseous will move the middle finger radially, and the fourth dorsal interosseous would abduct the ring finger. So this is snuff in the anatomical snuff box. What are the tendons that form the boundaries A and B of the anatomical snuff box? A is the posterior boundary. Remember that we describe the body according to the anatomical position. So A is extensor pollicis longus, the tendon that turns around the dorsal tubercle of the radius. 
and B is formed of two tendons. It is anteriorly located. The two tendons are the tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. You can see here the dorsal venous arch on the dorsum of the hand and the beginning of the cephalic vein very close to the anatomical snub box and the styloid process of the radius. Which anatomical structure is involved in this deformity? This is a mallet finger deformity when a finger is forcibly hit at the distal interphalangeal joint. This causes it to bend forwards quite suddenly and this causes the tendon of the extensor expansion that is attached to the distal phalanx to pull off the bone. Usually it pulls off without a piece of bone, but sometimes it can pull off a fragment of bone resulting in an avulsion fracture, but in both cases there is a mallet finger deformity. Identify the muscle, what is its nerve supply, and what is its action on the metacarpophalangeal joint. This is the first dorsal interosseous muscle. Note that it is located between two metacarpal bones and it is bulky and bicipital arising from both adjacent bones like other dorsal interosseous muscles. Like all the interossei, whether dorsal or palmar interossei, they are all supplied by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. This muscle, the first dorsal interosseous muscle, acts on the index finger, abducting it at the metacarpophalangeal joint and as you can see here that the muscle is also attached to the extensor expansion on the dorsum of the digit and so it can act on the extensor expansion causing flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint as well as extension of the interphalangeal joints. Identify the muscle A and B what is the nerve supply of each and what is the action of each on the metacarpophalangeal joint? A is a muscle seen on the dorsum of the hand between two metacarpal bones. It is a dorsal interosseous muscle and to be specific it is the second dorsal interosseous muscle. To remember their function the palmar adduct while the dorsal abduct pad and dab. In addition to Abduction that is performed by muscle A, second dorsal interosseous muscle. The muscle is also attached to the extensor expansion so it can flex the metacarpophalangeal joint and extend the interphalangeal joints through the attachment to the extensor expansion. So it is an abductor and a flexor of the metacarpophalangeal joint. As any other interosseous muscle in the hand, it is supplied by the deeper branch of the ulnar nerve. For the marker B, two of the long extensor tendons are seen here on their way to the index finger. The lateral one is a slip of extensor digitorum muscle, and the medial one is the tendon of extensor indices. Here you can see the tendon popping up from in between the tendons because the, the muscle is deeper to the, to the extensor digitorum so its tendon pops up in between the tendons of extensor digitorum muscles. Both the tendons of extensor indices and extensor digitorum they extend the metacarpophalangeal joint of the index finger and then they will form the extensor expansion like in the other medial forefingers. Now being an extensor muscle, extensor indices and extensor digitorum are supplied in the forearm by the posterior interosseous nerve, a branch of the radial nerve, the nerve of extensor compartments of the arm and forearm, being derived from posterior divisions of the brachial plexus.